Chapter nine, here we are. We're gonna talk about moments of inertia for areas. Now, you can also find moments of inertia for masses, and that's what you'll do in dynamics. For this course, though, we're gonna focus on moments of inertia for areas. Now, the moment of inertia for an area is basically the second moment of the area. And I know that doesn't really mean much to you, uh, but essentially what it is, is it's the measure of the resistance to rotation or the resistance to angular acceleration about a certain axis. That's all it is. All right, so how, how much effort you're gonna have to put in uh, to rotate a body or an area in this case. So for instance, let's say we have something like this. This is a cylinder. Let's just say there's an axis going through it and we're trying to rotate the cylinder about this axis. Okay, so we've got this smaller one. Now let's say we have a bigger cylinder. Right there. Now, which one of these is gonna be easiest to rotate about that axis? This one's gonna be easier, right? And that's because everything's closer to this axis of rotation. Here, everything is farther spread out. We've got this larger radius here. So moment of inertia is just going to give you a measure of you know, the resistance to that rotation about a certain axis. That's all it is. And it's called the second moment of, an, of the area. You'll see why when we get to the equation. You might not have known it, but the centroid is the first moment of area. And the reason why it's called that, if you look at your equation, we have the integral of x times dA, for instance. If you think of x as being a moment arm, then this indeed is the first moment of area, because dA represents an area. Now, these things are going to be used, the moments of inertia, they will be used uh, in strength of materials. You'll use it when you're studying bending and several other topics. You use mass moments of inertia in dynamics when you're looking at rigid body motion for instance. So there's lots of uses for moments of inertia and you'll see them over and over again. Sometimes they'll be for areas, sometimes they'll be for masses. Now moments of inertia, they are going to originate whenever forces are distributed over an area. All right, because remember the forces tend to cause a rotation, right? If they are distributed. Now let's draw a picture out. We're gonna have x, we got y, and then let's draw some area. So this is some area A, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus in on a tiny area, dA. Okay. Now what we wanna do is, since remember, we said we're finding the moment of an area, we wanna find our perpendicular distances. So if we measure from x up to dA, that's the distance y. We can also measure from the y-axis over, that's x. Now notice these are perpendicular distances. And we can also measure from the origin over here, so say that's O, and let that be R. That's just a radial distance. All right, now, what we wanna do is we wanna find the second moments of area about each of the axes. So the x-axis and then the y-axis. All right, so we're gonna have moments of inertia of dA about the x and y axes. And our equation, we're gonna have dIx, where Ix stands for moment of inertia about the x-axis, that's going to equal the second moment of area. So we're gonna have y squared because that's the perpendicular distance between the x-axis and dA, and then you're gonna multiply it by dA. Now I don't want this derivative term over here, so I'm gonna integrate both sides. That gives me Ix equals the integral y squared dA. All right, so now you have your moment of inertia about the x-axis. You can do the same thing for the y-axis. 
Now we're going about this axis. So our perpendicular distance here needs to be x. It's the second moment, so we need to square it and multiply it by dA. That's going to give us iy equals the integral of x squared dA. So there are your equations. Now this only gives us for x and y. There's also a third axis, which is the z-axis, which is coming out of the page in this case, through this point O. And the moment of inertia about that axis is called the polar moment of inertia. All right, and again, that's just your second moment of area about the z-axis. And this moment of inertia, this is going to give you a measure of the resistance to twisting or torsion. And torsion is something you'll talk about in mechanics of materials or solid mechanics. And essentially it's kind of like a twisting motion. So think about if you have a towel and you twist each end, that's a twisting motion. So this polar moment of inertia will give you a measure of the resistance to that sort of twisting behavior. And our equation, we're going to call it J. That's just the standard notation. We'll have J sub O, O being this origin here, indicating it's about that z-axis. And then that is going to equal the integral of R squared. So that radial distance squared times dA. And the reason why you get this equation, if you look here, you can make a right triangle where we have R, Y, and then this is X. So with that, we know that R squared equals X squared plus Y squared. So if you use this fact, then you can extend this out and say that that's equal to IX plus IY. All right, because then you'd have X squared times DA plus y squared times dA, which gives you ix plus iy. So this is your equation for polar moment of inertia. All right. And that's what you get there. Now, if you want to look at the units, here we've got x squared times um, dA. So x squared, x is a unit of length. So we'd have length squared. Area has units of length squared, so you're overall units will be meters to the fourth, for instance. All right, so it's just going to be a unit of length to the power of four. And that's what you'll get for your units. Okay. All right, so now that we've got that done, let's talk about something called the parallel axis theorem, and this is going to be something you're going to use quite a bit. Now, if we go back to the tables that we had before, So these were the ones we used for centroids, right? We had these shapes, and let's say we have this centroid C right here. Okay, and notice we've got this x-axis and then the y-axis, and we've got these equations. So we have ix, iy. This equation here is telling you the moment of inertia about this x-axis. These two axes here are called centroidal axes. Okay, so in a lot of the cases, you're going to have tables like this that will give you the moments of inertia about those centroidal axes. The parallel axis theorem, what that allows us to do is to find the moment of inertia about an axis that's parallel to the centroidal axes. So let's say I wanted to find the moment of inertia about an axis right here at the bottom of the rectangle. Parallel axis theorem will let us do that. Okay. So let's, let's talk about that. So let's write down parallel axis theorem. Like we said, it's used to find a moment of inertia about a parallel axis. And it's going to be parallel to the centroidal axes. OK. And we usually use the centroidal axes because we have that information available, typically. Okay. 
Oops. All right. So let's draw another picture. So we got X, we got Y, and then we're going to draw another area. So there's our area. And now I'm going to have the centroid of this area. We're going to say it's right there. So there's our centroid. Now what I want to do is I'm going to put axes through the centroid. And I'm going to call this X prime, Y prime. Now these two are going to be centroidal axes. Because they go right through the centroid. Now what I'm wanting to do is I'm wanting to find the moment of inertia about this X axis or this Y axis over here. All right not the centroidal axes. So what we're going to do, let's pull out a little area. Here's our DA. And now we need to look at our distances. So in this prime coordinate system where we have the X prime, Y prime, let's get our distances up to DA. So here we'll have Y prime. That's your distance between the X prime axis and DA. And then we'll have X prime going from Y prime to DA. So now we've got that. Now I also want to measure from the axis I'm interested in. So I'm interested in this X axis and this Y axis. I need the distance to get up to the centroidal axes or the centroid. So here, let's call this DY. And then this one that goes from the Y axis over to the centroid, let's call it DX. And just like we did before, let's have this radial distance. Let's call it D. And let's call that 0. 0.0. Now I want to find the moment of inertia about X. And to do that, our equation, we're going to have DIX. And now remember, it's the second moment of the area. So I'm measuring from this axis. I need to get up here to DA. I need that perpendicular distance. So that distance is going to be DY plus the Y prime. And then I need to square it and multiply it by DA. All right, so just like we did before, but now we have this new distance here. Now you're going to go ahead and integrate. And once you integrate, what you get is IX equals IX prime bar. We'll talk about that in just a second. Plus A times DY squared. That's what you'll get. Now let's think about why we get this. So let's look back up here. We're going to integrate both sides. So the D goes away here. Now on this one, if you look at what we have, we have area times dy. Once we integrate, we get rid of this d part for the area. And then if you look, we're going to have the area times dy squared, because this is squared. And then we're left with the y prime part. So that gives us y prime squared times the dA. Once you integrate all that, you get the x, uh, the ix prime with the bar. This bar right here is just indicating that that's the moment of inertia about an axis that goes through the centroid. All right, so see X prime went through the centroid here. The bar just indicates that that's about a centroidal axis. So anytime you see that bar, think centroid. And we saw that when we did centroids because the coordinate locations were X bar, Y bar, and Z bar. Okay, so we have the moment of inertia about the X prime axis. And now you can do the same thing for the Y axis. So you'll have IY. That's going to equal IY prime bar plus A DX squared. And then you have your moment of inertia about that Z axis or the polar moment of inertia. That's going to be JO. It's going to equal JC prime, or not prime, bar. C just indicates the centroid, so the z-axis coming out of that centroid right there, plus area times d squared, where d is this distance here. 
which would be dx squared plus dy squared. So these are going to be your parallel axis theorem equations, and these are going to be important. All right. So now that we've got that, let's move on to the last topic. This is going to be for radius of gyration of an area. Now the radius of gyration of an area, oops, I can't spell here. That's a measure of the distribution of the area from an axis. And what that basically means is if we have an area, let's just say it looks like that. If we find the radius of gyration, that means we can concentrate our area, the same area here, we can concentrate it at a distance of radius of gyration. All right, so. So our symbol is going to be k. So if we have kx, that's going to give you the distance away from the y-axis where you need to concentrate your area. So if the total area of this rectangle is the same as this, if we concentrate it at this distance away, we're going to have the same rotation as this original shape about the y-axis. All right. And I just noticed we have a typo here. This should say area, not mass. All right, so concentrating our area of the entire body at that point, or that radius from the axis, it's going to produce that same rotation as the original shape. Now this is going to be used to design columns and a bunch of other things in structural mechanics. And it's actually an easy calculation. If you know your areas and your moments of inertia, then your radius of gyration about the x-axis is just going to be square root of ix over a. ky is going to be the square root of iy over a. ko is going to be the square root of the polar moment of inertia over a. Just like that. All right. So now we've got that. So again, people get confused about this, what the radius of gyration is. It's basically just you're going to concentrate your area at a distance away from your axis, and then you'll still get the same rotation. All right, that's all it is. So don't get too confused by it. Now, you have a relationship between these three things. The radius of gyration about uh, that O point or that Z axis, your polar radius of gyration, you square that, that equals kx squared plus ky squared. All right. So there you have it. So let's stop there and then we'll go into the examples and we'll kind of do some more explanations as we go through those examples. See you then.